Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Learn to Discern webinar. We are so glad you're here, either with us live or watching it recorded. As always, if you have sound issues, can't hear us or hear something strange or can't see anything, please let us know in the comments so that we can address it. But I think that we are good on our setup. So your presenters today are me, Allegra Davis Hanna. I am an English instructor at TCC Connect, and I'm the department chair for English and Humanities. A shout out to all my students. And I'm Misty Wilson Mertens. I teach history, and I'm the chair for the social sciences. We're sorry we're getting started a little late, guys. We were trying to avoid technical difficulties. So today we are going to talk about identity politics. And identity politics is something that you might have heard a lot about um, in conversations or on the internet. And so we have a professional here to explain it. So Professor Wilson, tell me what are identity politics? So identity politics is the belief that your identity determines your political outcomes and your alliances. Okay. And what we mean by identity is your ethnicity, your gender, your sexuality, religion, citizenship, maybe even something like where you live in the country. All of that factors into who you are. So how long have we been talking about identity or ID politics? Well, we've been using it forever since we were tribes in the deserts, but actually using that phrase in the 1970s. Okay. And do you think that the general conversation about identity politics is that it's good or bad? Most people that are going to use that phrase, identity politics, are going to criticize it. So they use it as a negative term. Yes. Okay. But there are good and bad things about this. So groups that use identity politics are going to work to advance their own agenda, mm -hmm. which is good. So yeah. we have a picture here of Black Lives Matter. Yes. That's a great example of this. Yes. It may force people to choose which part of their identity they're going to act on. That's not so good. Okay, so you might have competing interests. So if you're a black woman, you might be told you have to choose between Black Lives Matter or Me Too. You can't do both. That's what? not true. Of course. But that's what you might be told. Okay, gotcha. So our identity groups are sometimes assigned to us at birth, and sometimes you choose them. Sure, so assigned to you at birth being gender, race, those kind of things. Okay. Um, I guess for some people here, Cowboys fan is assigned at birth. <laughs> But for the most part, it it's is a an choice. identity that you choose. You identify with Cowboys fans. You identify as a Cowboys fan. Right. But this is so, so deeply ingrained to us as humans mm -hmm. that once we assign ourselves to a group, we are definitely very emotionally attached to these groups. Mm -hmm. So a football fan is a great example of this. People can go a little nuts about their teams. And that's fairly non-political. Yeah. So if you add in politics to that, it's going to be even more so. Do you think being a fan of a football team has ever been the motive for the way someone voted? I hope not. I mean, I hope not. But do you ever think, like, this will help the Cowboys, so I'm going to vote for this person? Again, I hope not. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you guys really quickly about a study that is in Amy Chua's book. And we're going to talk about that book in a minute. And she looked at kids who were assigned just randomly red and blue shirts. Mm -hmm. And then they looked at other pictures of kids in red and blue shirts. And kids that were wearing blue shirts all said that the kids wearing other blue shirts were more intelligent, were faster, were stronger. So I randomly get a shirt. Mm -hmm. And if it's red, anytime I see a picture of a kid with a red shirt, I think that kid's cooler yes. than everybody else. Right, and that shows how deeply this idea of in-group, out-group yes. is wired into us. Yes. And so, again, that's T-shirts. Right. So sometimes it is or can be arbitrary or something that we accept without really examining. Exactly. And sometimes it is an identity that we carefully and closely examine. Exactly. So when we think about personal identity politics, when I say what are my identity politics, I'm not going to tell you mine necessarily, but it's really to say that your political actions are motivated by what's most relevant about your own identity. Exactly. And these can be weighted at different levels for different people. Sure. So gender may not always be the most pressing concern for a woman. But or for a another man. or a man, but for another woman it could be. Yes. 
So it varies. Sure. So just because you are one thing doesn't mean you're only one right. thing. Because all women don't vote for the same political candidates or exactly. the same things. Sure. Mm-hmm. So you prioritize your votes or contributions to political campaigns based on the identities most important to you or that you most identify with. Exactly. And you might start to form those kinds of exclusive political alliances or groups based on those interests. Exactly. The interests of women, the interests of people of color, the interests of Cowboys fans. Texans. (laughs) Texans, sure. And so what are some identities that tend to get prioritized when we talk about ID politics? So when we're talking about ID politics, there's really three levels of identity. Mm -hmm. So we have your passive identity, your active identity, and your politicized identity. Okay. So your passive identity is things that are part of your identity, but that you don't think that much about. You don't walk around with it front of your mind all day, every day. I'm a brunette. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, class issues tend to be that way. Okay. You don't really think of yourself existing in a world where you're in a class unless you're like in an economics class or unless you're thinking about class specifically. Yeah. And then you might say, I'm in the middle class, I'm in the upper class, I'm in the lower class. Okay. But I don't walk around all day wearing that on a t-shirt thinking about it. Yeah. An active identity is something that you're more aware of, Mm -hmm. that's more consciously present in your life, Mm -hmm. but that you're not politically motivated by. Okay. So I might be aware that I'm a woman all day long every day. Sure. But maybe I'm not politically motivated by that. Okay. And then my politicized identity is those things in my identity that actually do push me to go from active to politicized. So those are your priority yes. identifiers. Yes. Okay. That is the most important thing. Okay. Does everybody vote according to their identity? Is this something that pretty much everybody engages in? Or are there people who do and don't do this? There are people who do and don't do this. Okay. But most of us do it most of the time. Okay. So your identity can change over time throughout mm-hmm. your life. Mm-hmm. And like I said, it can also be weighted. So certain things can be different parts. Yeah. So uh, this is a book, Political Tribes, that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. And she really goes into a lot of these ideas here. And I wanted to ask these questions so people and just kind of start thinking about them. So what parts of your idea are most important to you? What parts are likely to propel you to political activism? And then think about it this way. What political tribes do you belong to? And you likely belong to more than one. Okay. What about being invested in an interest that isn't something you identify with? What if you are a white person who is politically motivated by Black Lives Matter? Or what if you are a man who is politically motivated by women's reproductive issues? So those are the exceptions to the rule, right? Okay. So generally, usually, typically you are going to think of your own group first. Okay. And that's kind of just like hardwired into our brains and it's not a bad thing. Okay. But if you can look for allies and other opportunities in other groups, that's how we build political alliances. Okay. So having more than one of those groups comes together actually will benefit you faster. And to to realize that you have shared interests. Exactly. The women's movement and Black Lives Matter have shared interests. Exactly. Okay. So because I'm a historian, Mm -hmm. I just need to say this. This is nothing new. We've always, always done this stuff. Okay. So um, this Because people do talk about identity politics like it's some kind of new phenomenon. And it's not. So this is John C. Calhoun, and you can tell from this picture that this is back in the day. This is not a modern day politician. I sure hope not. John C. Calhoun is from the South. He's a slaveholder. He's one of the men that is going to help us get into the Civil War. Okay. And he is going to say in 1848... That with the two great divisions of society are not rich and poor, but white and black. And of the former, the poor as well as the rich belong to the upper class and are respected and treated as equals. Well, first off, that's not true. But beyond that, what he's saying is, don't think of yourself as lower class. Don't think of yourself as a poor farmer instead of a planter. Ignore all of those other groups you belong to. You belong to the white group. And that's how you should vote. Regardless of your income level or other identifying factors. Exactly. So he's saying prioritize your this race. identity group. As your most important identity. Exactly. So this isn't new. We've always done it. Yeah, 1848 was pretty long ago. Yes. Yeah, pre-Civil War. It's just this idea now that it's been reintroduced since the 1960s and 70s. Sure. That it's gotten a lot of criticism. And I also want to point out that this happens on left issues and right issues yes 
So this is not one side uses this and the other side doesn't. And that's the other way it gets talked about a lot, right? It A lot of times people accuse liberals or Democrats of relying on identity politics. Exactly. But it's you're saying it's on both sides of that political spectrum. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at these movements I have here, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the American Indian movement, they were all very specifically grouped to one side or the other. Mm-hmm. But Nixon's Southern strategy looked at whites in the South as a voting bloc. And then the moral majority looked at conservative Christians as a voting bloc. Yeah. But they all are centered around that identity. Yeah. So it's not one side or the other. It's both. And so there are some people who are politically motivated because of their faith. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So if we're going to talk about the critiques of identity politics, these are things that people find wrong with it. Okay. So this is why people constantly bash it on the internet. Yes. Okay. Uh, The first one is that being in part of one of these groups can alienate another group. Sure. Or it can lessen the focus on another group. Yeah. So there is competing interests here, right? Mm -hmm. Our founding fathers talked about factions and factions are going to have to fight it out. That's essentially what these groups are having to do. Yeah. But there are some people who view this as a zero sum game. So a gain for Black Lives Matter is a negative for the Latino X movement. But that's not really true. Well, I mean, it depends on your worldview, if you believe that's true or not. But it doesn't have to be it doesn't true. Have it's not to necessarily be true, true no. that no. if women get more rights, then men have fewer rights. Exactly. Okay. It also lessens the focus on individualism. No, I think this one is actually a valid criticism. Yeah. And I think that Professor Thurman just made a similar comment, right? So it helps you fit in, but it causes you to think less for yourself, maybe. Or allows you to think less for yourself. Or it makes you vote against sometimes your own economic interest. Explain that to me. So if I'm part of an identity group centered around, let's say, gender. Okay. But I'm also in the 1%. Sure. Let's pretend. Yeah, let's pretend. It'll be fun. Um, I might have this conflict within me about how I want to vote for things. Sure. Because I might get better tax laws. Right. Voting for one yeah. side. And yeah. I might get more rights as a citizen voting for the other side. Okay. But those are competing interests. And I do have to choose what I'm going to do. And I lose my individualism somewhat in that. Sure. And there are a lot of people now thinking about 2020 Mm -hmm. who have to decide whether they want to vote for a person who they agree with on moral or ethical or political reasons. But that person might not be willing to forgive my student loans. Exactly. So I have to decide which of those things is more important to me that part of my identity or that financial gain that I might get. Right. And there are competing interests when you talk about politics. This isn't all about identity. Right. Because there isn't a politician who you're going to find 100 percent matches all of your identities. 100 percent would get you the best in every. Right. Yeah, exactly. And it also can remove this idea of shared national destiny, which is something we talk about in history kind of a lot. This idea that American history is like a linear timeline, and we're all gaining rights, and we're all progressing together. We have a shared destiny as a nation. Mm -hmm. If you start breaking people up into different groups, Mm -hmm. it is a lot harder to tell that story and to have people see themselves as a shared, unified nation. So that's people might be of the belief that I should prioritize my identity as an American Yes. Over my identity as a woman or anything else. Exactly. Okay. So, again, depending on your worldview, that can be a valid criticism. Yeah. We need to worry about country over specific individual groups, especially if we have a common enemy. Sure. So, during World War II, exactly. pri- prioritizing being an American made a lot of sense. Exactly. Okay. So, the reason that we are talking about this a lot right now you might hear this a lot in the news but one we're about to enter a campaign cycle so Mm -hmm. that's one thing yeah but the other reason you're going to hear stuff about identity politics is because we are in a time right now of major shifts major demographic shifts are coming in our country okay and anytime we see that people get uncomfortable yeah or they get concerned about where they're going to end up when everything's kind of shaken up and laid out again sure so what you're seeing here are the coming demographic shifts. 
So the big one that's going to hit first is age. The age of our population is changing. Yes. And not only are some people like moving into the boomers are getting older. Yeah. But more millennials are entering the workplace. So there's generational divides there. Yes. And now we have this generation behind the millennials coming yeah. up. And yeah. they're going to be entering the workforce pretty soon. Yeah. So all of that creates some social tension. And you can see yourself as voting as a millennial, by the way, or voting as a boomer. Sure. Those are identities. Sure. The other big shift is... Millennials getting- all have college debt, by the way, so... <laughs> Uh, the other big shift is going to be race. So in experts say 2040 or 2044, whites will no longer be the majority of this country. Okay. So it'll be a plurality, right? There won't be w- a group larger. Nobody will have 51%. Okay. It'll slip to like 48% or something. Okay. So they'll still be the largest voting group mm-hmm. if they vote as a group. Which they won't. Which they won't. But right. Yeah. Um, but it's less than 51%. So that is making people nervous because we have so many demographic changes. Yes. And then also we have changing views on religion and family and gender, which we talk about kind of a lot in sociology classes. And people are shuffling their priorities. Exactly. So more women might be concerned with women's issues than in the past. And Black Lives Matter is a relatively new movement, although, of course, movement for civil rights is not new. Exactly. Uh, one of our students commented that because they belong to a specific identity group, that it might cause them to have preconceived notions about people outside of that group. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. That happens. And that I mean, that that's not just political, right? That's part of belonging to a group. That's part of being human. Yes. So the being aware of it means that you have the ability to kind of check yourself and say, let me take a step back being aware that you have a bias is the first step in bridging the gap and admitting it being aware and admitting it yeah Yeah. you're never going to completely conquer your biases right but at least being aware of them you know where your trigger spots are absolutely so another reason that we are more concerned about the idea of identity politics now than we ever have been before Mm -hmm. is because we are at a time of increased polarization so if you're looking at this chart here which is from the pew you see that in 1994, mm-hmm. we had a left and a right. Sure. But they were kind of in the center. And they had a lot in common. Yes. And, I mean, the left was not that far left. The right was not that far right. Yeah. And then in 2004, a little bit more of a divide. Mm-hmm. The left moved a little bit further left. But now look at 2014. And, and, by the way, it looks very similar today. I just couldn't have a nice chart for it today. Yeah, so not only are the, the, the peaks farther apart, meaning there are more people who are kind of farther away from the center. There are fewer people who are consistently one or the other. Moderate, yeah. Yeah, there are fewer people who share values. So we have less in common, or we perceive we have less in common. We perceive that we have less in common, and the left is more left, the right is more right. So that idea of middle ground and compromise is a lot harder when you're dealing with two poles versus... A huge center. Especially since, and this was one of the points you made earlier, a lot of things we do have shared interests in. It benefits all of us for our economy to be strong. Yeah. It It benefits all of us to be safe. Exactly. Yeah. So we do have a lot of things in common. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, I know. Well, one more thing before we talk about what we have in common. Yeah, I know. (laughs) So this is kind of an idea that you brought up a minute ago. Our conceived notions of the other side yeah have dramatically shifted yeah so if you look at this chart and again from pew what you're seeing here is that the most partisan amongst us Mm -hmm. believe that the opposing party's policies are quote so misguided they threaten the nation's well-being whoa we didn't used to talk like that about the other side yeah so what you're saying is that if I'm looking at this chart, the blue, I'm guessing, represents Democrats. It yes. does, okay. So 27% of Democrats in 2014 mm-hmm. saw the Republican Party as a threat to the nation's well-being. So not just people I don't necessarily agree with. Right, which is how we used to think of them. But a third or almost a third of Democrats thought Republicans were a threat to our well-being. So that really... And then 36% of Republicans saw Democrats that way, which really means that you see them not as political rivals, but as actual adversaries. 
And you see them as an us versus them. Yeah. And you don't see the other side as fully logical, reasonable, yeah. or human. Yeah. You fail to see where policies are coming from and say, say well, they're doing that because they're evil. Yeah. And that shuts down the conversation. Yeah. Where can you go from there? Or I'm, I'm, even if I agree with what you're saying, I'm going to vote against you because I don't want to be perceived as being in agreement with you because you're trying to destroy everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Me personally. <laughs> like Godzilla, loose in the city. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you are. You teach history. So another one more reason we're worried. And God, this feels like um, we keep saying this and all of these things. Social media. Yeah, for people who are broadcasting things on YouTube, we yeah. sure do criticize social media a lot. Social media can be a problem. So one of the issues of social media is that we do create filter bubbles. So that is, if I'm on Twitter, I have the very handy ability to screen out any views I don't agree with. Yeah. I can block, I can hide, I can mute. Yes. And that's a wonderful thing. Yes. But then I live in a filter bubble because I'm only seeing things I agree with. So I want to I want to pause you there. Sure. It's not necessarily true that that blocking people puts you in a bubble. I mean, some people you got to block, right? Well, yes. Bullies, trolls, people who say hurtful things, people who say hateful things. Those people definitely block. That's healthy behavior. Get those voices away. Don't engage with people who are here to be hateful. Yes. But if you're just saying that is a person who's posting things I don't agree with. I'm a blue shirt. They're a red shirt. Okay. I'm blocking all red shirts. That means that all you're ever hearing from is blue shirts. Exactly. Which means you don't really know what the red shirts are thinking. Actually are trying to do. And so you'll never know what you have in common with them because you right. never really hear what they have to say. Right. Yeah. So that's one problem. Yeah. The other problem with social media is that it actually does make us more partisan. So even if I choose not to filter out those voices. Yeah. If I'm a blue shirt and I go read the red shirts, studies have shown that that actually makes me more dedicated to my blue shirtness. Sure, because you can find one minute thing that you maybe otherwise wouldn't have heard. Or you can read a totally and completely reasonable argument, but then the comment section is red <laughs> shirts that are going crazy, and then I'm yeah. like, well, I don't want to be like those people. Don't read the comments. Yeah, that's, that's a good rule for the Never internet. Never read the internet comments. So it's a really challenging problem Yeah, for political polarization. Absolutely. And we don't have good solutions yet for social media. Other than to be aware that those kind of biases can exist. The other thing is a lot of it is trash. Like yeah. a lot of it is people intentionally spreading misinformation. Yeah. But um, studies do show that the more you are exposed to legitimate news sources of ranging types of slants and leans, yeah. the more likely you are to have a full picture of things. So if you can maybe not read your news on Twitter, but actually like read it from a newspaper website. Yeah. You will probably do a little bit better. Okay. I like that there's a comment on YouTube that says comments on YouTube are the worst. <laughs> I agree, but it's just funny that it came in the form of a YouTube comment. So the thing is, even though we're in this time of polarization and we talk a lot about how like nobody is getting along and nobody's listening to anybody else, really, actually, we're kind of on the same page a lot of the time. And this chart is, is interesting. I mean, I'm aware of these election results. This is an election that I voted in. But it, we do tend to think of certain states as being very consistently one side or the other. And some states are. But text, But that doesn't mean it can't change. Well, right? it doesn't mean it can't change. And even if you're one state or the other, it's still kind of purple. Yeah. I mean, Texas is considered a very red state. Yeah. We're considered a very Republican state. Yeah. But 48% of the people that voted did not vote for Ted Cruz. Right. That's 48%. That's about as close as an election can get, right? Yeah. And we're still a quote unquote red state. Yeah. So that means in your neighborhood lives somebody who voted the opposite of you. Yeah. And that doesn't make them a bad person and it doesn't make them unreasonable. And you probably actually like them a lot. And you probably agree with them on On a lot of things. things. Yeah, if you look at um, this data here, these are issues, and, I, and I'm going to admit, I cherry-picked because I was looking for things that are sure high agreement, but these are from Gallup polls, and these are things that Americans overwhelmingly agree on. 90% of Americans favor universal background checks for buying a gun. But we don't have them. Well, but if you listen to the debate about that, you would think that nobody agrees on anything. Exactly. But 90% of Americans actually agree on something with gun control. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. of Americans favor protections for dreamers. Yeah. Again, we scream and yell about immigration all day, every day. 85% of us 
agree for protections for dreamers. Yeah. That's not even close to being controversial at this point. Tell me about this next one, because I don't understand what this is. You don't know what civil forfeiture is? No. Ask me again to make me feel dumber. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, civil forfeiture is the idea that the police can seize your property. Okay. Uh, especially during an arrest. And they can sell it and make money from it. No, I don't think they should do that. <laughs> yeah, most people agree with you, Allegra. 84%. Yeah, I don't know who those 16 other percent are, but... I guess people who go to police auctions, probably. Or, I guess, police. Yeah. And then 83% of Americans support mer- medical marijuana. I'm surprised that's not higher. I'm not. Because I think for some people, they think that that's the first step to getting oh, okay. recreational. So, they just, yeah, they okay. just want to keep the gates up. Okay. So how does it, so it's an issue we're divided what do we do This is hard And the other learn to discern beyond digital outrage webinars we've done mm-hmm. it's been really easy cuz we've told you go donate here yeah. or volunteer here there's an art contest Yeah this one's harder because you have to do some internal work you and, to- and the good news is it sounds like a lot of students in our comments are doing that internal work they're thinking about preconceived notions and bias they're thinking about which groups they belong to or which identities they're prioritizing. They're talking about voting. So I think people are ready to do that. But it is hard and you have to be honest. It's not as easy as I'm going to go clean out all of my old t-shirts and give them to Goodwill. Sure. It's a little bit more. Although you should do that also. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit more of wrestling with yourself. So the first thing you have to do is be aware of your identity mm-hmm. and your political motivations. Yeah. Um, there are all kinds of internet tests you can find if you are interested to see like where you lean or which way you end up. And we have a video from, from a previous semester called Finding Your Political Identity. Finding Your Political Identity. And that goes, to, that kind of takes you through the process of defining what your political beliefs are and where you fall on that spectrum and how to get information about candidates. Right. And then the next thing you're going to have to do is prioritize those identity markers that you think you care about. Because you might have to choose which one is more important to me, which candidate most matches this, even if they don't match X. Mm -hmm. Then you have to be open to dialoguing with those who disagree with you. And this might be the one where... I don't want to do that. Exactly. (laughs) So this doesn't mean agreeing with them, and it doesn't mean converting them to your beliefs. Oh. This means... Be able to see the logic and reason for the policies they have. Because there is a logic and reason on both sides. Yeah. And then be able to articulate why that logic and reason doesn't work for you. Yeah. It's not enough to say, I'm supportive of this. I'm supportive of this because Mm -hmm. Mm da-da-da-da. And I'm not supportive of this because this is this. Right. So I have to listen. I have to listen. And that can help me to see what we have in common. So you're not going to change necessarily who I'm voting for, my political beliefs. But now I see we have some things in common. And I have some things that I agree with you on. And I understand your viewpoint. So I'm, I don't see you as a crazy person who's trying to ruin the country. Right. I see that you're a person who's motivated by different factors. Exactly. Okay. And that also might help when you have to have conversations with somebody who is a little bit more angry. If you can say, okay, this person is upset, but I know generally where this person comes from. Mm -hmm. And there is some middle ground and we can find it. Yeah. All right. The next thing you have to do is be aware of candidates' positions. And this, for some people, can be challenging. Because maybe I just like the way Elizabeth Warren waves at crowds. It's just cute and I adore it. Or I, I like the things that people say in speeches, which are mostly emotional claims, right? Yes. We're, we're in this together and all those kinds of emotional... I like the way they talk. I, I agree with their approach to things. But if I read their voting record or their policies on specific issues, if I become really, truly informed, then I may see, I like your personality. I like the things that you say. I like your commercials. But I don't necessarily want to vote for you because you don't represent my interests. And this is also a way to push our candidates more towards the center if we want them to do that. Yeah. If I find myself more in the center, I can be in contact with my elected officials and say, I don't like your record on this, this, and this, and I need you to move a little bit more this way. Yeah. 
And they're going to get a thousand different letters like that from all different people. So but you if, may not be the deciding vote. But if 900 of the thousand say, change your position on this, mm-hmm. they might change their position a little bit. Right. Because they are reacting to what they think their constituency wants. Right. They're reflecting back what they think they hear. Yeah. So if we make the voice from the middle louder. Yeah. If that's what we want. Yeah. Then that's where politicians will have to move. And that's also why it's important to vote in primaries. Yes. People think elections are the only time it's really important to vote. And primaries select which person from a political party is going to be the candidate. And so right. from all the people who you mostly agree with, who do you really agree with? Who is really representing your interests? And exactly. that's how you get your interests represented. And so and even when you think, oh, voting in a presidential election in Texas doesn't matter because it's probably going to go for the Republican candidate. Voting in the primary definitely matters. Exactly. Right. Because that's going to decide... Not only who the candidate is for both sides, yeah, uh, but also what positions they take in their policy platforms. Yeah, when we get to that point, absolutely. Um, the one other thing I want to say about voting mm-hmm. is that the deadline has passed to register for this coming election in November. Yes, but not for twenty twenty. But not for twenty twenty. Um, so, for sure, go get registered to vote. It's really simple. It's really easy. You should definitely do it. Unfortunately, you can't do it online. But you should get registered to vote, and um, you are only able to vote in one primary in Texas. You can't mm-hmm. vote in both. Yeah. So you'll have to pick the one you care about the most. And the primary is not until next year anyway. Right, but it's coming faster than you want to think about it. Yeah, I don't want to think about <laughs> it. The other thing is a lot of people can't vote because they're not eligible to vote. So what do I do if I care about an issue, but I'm not eligible to vote? So again, prioritizing which issues you care about the most because you only have a finite amount of energy. Sure. So whether it is a Latinx group or it's a women's group or it's a Christian political activist group, whatever it is, there are places for you to volunteer and donate your time and money. You can block walk. All of those are part of this. Right. And so get information. So I can't vote for a candidate, but I want to support them so I can pass out pamphlets and leave them on people's doors or I can do phone banks or all those kinds of things. Yeah. So you can volunteer for candidates even if you're not eligible to vote. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or causes, not just candidates. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. So the more important question for students is, how do I get so credit? It's not more important than getting your five points credit. I just want to say that. <laughs> just ask them. <laughs> um, so how do they get extra credit for attending our webinar? So in my class, you get real credit, not extra credit. But give us about five minutes. Don't tell them that. Then they're going to ask me for real credit. That's too late. It's already <laughs> happened. So we take the video down. We uh, reload it with a video description. And that description is going to have a link on it. You click on the link, Mm -hmm. and then you'll fill out a little form, and you need to tell us your name. That's the most important thing. Please don't forget that. (laughs) Your student ID, who your professor is, and then you're going to answer some questions. And if you get the questions wrong or you skip them, you don't get credit. Well, there's not a wrong because it's your opinions, but you do have to fill them out. Okay. I'm not going to tell anybody their opinion is wrong. Right, but you have to have paid attention. Yes. And know the information, answer the questions, and then you get credit. Yes. So Keep in th- mind that some professors don't add credit till the end of the semester, like me. So Miss Davis's class, calm down. And Professor Thurman's. So um, the link's active for 48 hours. So if you watch it live, which is right now, or if you watch it anytime before Friday afternoon, mm-hmm. that's live. We have a very generous view of live. Yeah. And then the um, results get emailed to your instructor sometime next week, and you get your credit. Okay. Do we have any questions from students? Once One question that's coming up is if... I want to vote if I want to contact someone who represents me who's already in office. So I know how to vote or volunteer for people who are campaigning for election or re-election. But how do I contact someone who's in office now? We actually did a video on this last year. Okay. So if you go back into our video library and look for how to get involved in the democratic system or how to contact your representatives, uh, we actually have scripts in there that you can use. Sure. So we have an email script, a phone script, and exactly what you need to do. Also, if you go to the website, who represents me, Mm -hmm. and you just type in your address, it'll give you everybody from the president down to dog catcher in your town. And most of the time, if you call them on the phone, which I know you don't like to call people on the phone, but there's a very small chance someone will answer and a very large chance you'll leave a voicemail. Mostly what they need is your name and your zip code. Yes. And either for or against whatever you're for or against. Yes. And basically, it's some poor intern's job to count the voicemails. To listen and check them off. Yeah. Yeah. But you can also send emails. You can also send... An actual letter? An, yeah. 
So all of those things. And I mean, you can tweet them. I don't know who moderates your tweets or if anybody counts them, but all politicians are on Twitter. And so you can tweet them that way. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? They are questioning uh, what we're talking about next on our next webinar. So uh, the next webinar is going to be Professor Davis Hanna. Yeah, it's me. And she's going to tell us about cults and secret societies. Absolutely. And we timed that one just about perfect because it's, it's right around Halloween. Spooky. And then I will be here on the 13th of November. And we are going to talk to some people who actually have taken their outrage and formed some nonprofit agencies. And how do you go about doing that if there's a cause you really care about? Okay. So unless we have any other questions, and I'm just going to give it a minute. All right, I think that's it. So we will see you next time. And we look forward to reading all of your survey responses. Thanks, guys.